be easy to take our daily routine for granted. Every day, going through the motions, at some point in time, at the end of our lives, we begin to ask ourselves, what did my life add up to? What did I live for? Who will remember me? What will they say about me when I'm gone? This is your wake up call. Well, I want to welcome everybody here today and also those who are watching us on the stream and on TV as well. This is our first 530 service that we have had for almost an entire year, but finally we are back with our 530, so we're thankful for you guys coming, thankful for you who are watching us. Uh, we hope that uh, the pandemic will continue to go away and that things will return to normal as soon as possible. A couple of things I want to make mention of before I get into the message today called Wake Up Call. Uh, first thing I want to make mention of is because of your incredible generosity all during this pandemic, we've been able to do some things that we normally wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do. And one of the things that we've just started is that now we are going to be broadcasting our worship service throughout the entire country of Belize. Um, this is a national channel, much like ABC or NBC or CBS. Yeah, it's awesome news. And so literally another 400,000 people are going to have the opportunity to hear the message of Jesus because of you guys' generosity. So if you're watching from Belize, we have a campus on Ambergris Key. It's in San Pedro town. We'd love for you to come check out our campus there. We also have the hopes of starting other campuses in Belize at some point in time as well. But if you don't have a church home, make us your church home. We would love to get you into a small group as well. But we're here for you. We're a little church in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and we just want to proclaim Jesus to you. So thanks for tuning in uh, to us as well. All right, that's one of the exciting things that's going on. Let me tell you another thing that's going on, and that is a thing called stay. Stages of the Cross. Uh, this is an opportunity for every one of our campuses. This doesn't include Belize, doesn't include Los Lunas, but all of our other New Mexico locations. This is an opportunity for you to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. You have to get a ticket in advance. You have to wear a mask as you go through. It's about 45 minutes to get through the whole thing. Uh, we've been working on this for four or five months. And so you'll go into a room. You'll see some things that happen on that particular day as Jesus heads towards the cross for his crucifixion and his resurrection. This is a family-friendly event. You can bring children with you as well. I'm not certain that someone under the age of eight or nine will get much out of it, to be honest with you. I think they'll be running around the room. So I don't know if you want to bring them to this or not. That's up to a parent. But you have to get tickets. We'll social distance you. There's only so many spots per hour, and tickets are going to go really, really fast. You say, how do I get tickets to have this experience? Because if you go through the stages of the cross, I promise you this, this Easter will be the most meaningful Easter you've ever had. How do I get tickets? It's real simple. Download the Sagebrush app. Open it up. You'll see a banner at the very top that says stages of the cross, walk through experience, register now. Click on to that. The next screen that's going to come up is you're going to tell us if you're going to attend or you're going to volunteer. I need hundreds of volunteers to pull this off. So if you want to be a tour guide where you take people from room to room, uh, we're asking you to volunteer for just two hours. You'll go through the experience two times with two different groups of people. But if you want to volunteer, we sure could use your help. If you want to attend, you click on attend. And then this screen will come up. It says pick which campus that you want to attend. Let's say we pick Riverside Campus. There's several days for the Riverside Campus. Not every campus has all that selection of days. So you want to make sure that you go to your campus and see what days are available and get your tickets as soon as possible. I know that we live in the land of manana. Don't do this with these tickets, all right? So once you pick what day, you're going to fill out your name, your uh, email address, and your phone number. That's all the information that we want. How many tickets that you want even tells you how many are left for that particular hour to go through. Then you're going to get an email. So make sure you check your junk email as well. It says, Stages of the Cross registration. There's a QR, QR code at the very bottom. You bring that information. We scan that, and you take a walk with Jesus to the cross, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We've never tried anything like this before, and we, we are so excited uh, to make this available to you, and we think it will be very, very meaningful, okay? So that's a little bit on Stages of the Cross. Let's get into our message today called Wake Up Call. Kyle Eidelman says we should imagine from time to time that we're going on vacation. Now, doesn't that sound pretty nice? 
with all the pandemic stuff, most of us haven't had a chance to get out of the house and, and go do something that's fun. We're not going to get too aggressive. We're going to think about where, where we go maybe this summer. And maybe what's on your mind might be, I don't know, maybe the Grand Canyon. Say we're going to go to the Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon is beautiful. It's majestic. It will absolutely take your breath away. So you're going to the Grand Canyon. So what does anybody do when you're going to go on vacation? You've got to find a place to stay. So if you're like my wife, you start searching the Internet for a place to stay, and you find this cute little cabin right off one of the rims of the Grand Canyon. And it's not that expensive at all, and the pictures are gorgeous. And you say to yourself, this is going to be awesome. This is going to be a great week, and so you book it. Well, you drive up to this cabin, you know, time for your vacation, and you're a little shocked because the pictures on the internet aren't even close to what the actual cabin looks like. Has anybody ever had an experience like that before? What you see and what you get are two different things. Carpet is all torn up, furniture is messed up, cabinets are messed up, wallpapers peeling from the side. And you look at your spouse, you look at your kids, you say, oh my goodness, we can't stay here for a week in these conditions. So you decide to remodel it. You get a demolition crew to come in. You take out the carpet. You peel the wallpaper. You put on brand new paint, brand new carpet. You put cherry cabinets up there. You put granite countertop. Oh, honey, hush. This is going to be super nice. I mean, you're just updating it and updating it. You even put a hot tub out on your brand new deck overlooking the grand canyon. I mean, it's shaping up better than you thought, but you're running out of money. In fact, your savings account is completely gone from the remodel, but you say, that's all right. I've got credit cards. So on your credit card, you buy yourself flat screen TV with surround sound. You buy new furniture, and you look around after six days, and you say, wow, complete transformation, and you feel pretty good about it. In fact, you go to bed on that last night that you're going to be there and your brand new pillow top mattress that you purchased on your credit card. You're like, wow, it was so worth it. But then the next morning, you get a wake-up call. And it's the rental agency reminding you that you have to check out at 11 o'clock that day. Now, here's the question. How foolish does a person have to be to spend their entire life savings on a property that they rented for seven days. How foolish does a person have to be to give everything that they are and everything they hope to be to that which is here today and that which is gone tomorrow? And yet we find ourselves doing this all the time, don't we? How many times have you heard people, you know, they're making a living, but they never make a life? Oh, they're, they're chasing the American dream. They're chasing their tail. They're working their little heads off. And for what? Stuff that's here today and gone tomorrow? How many people have you encountered who are so busy making a name for themselves that they never get around to making God's name great? How many people do you know that are so busy building up their kingdom that's here today and gone tomorrow, and they never get around to building up the kingdom of God? Friends, the Bible says that our life is but a mist, right? It's here today and gone tomorrow. <laughs> that one got me good. <laughs> okay, that was powerful. More powerful than the others. Okay, great. Isn't that the way it goes? We, we, we give everything to all these things. Here today and gone tomorrow. Jesus knew this would be a problem for us. So he wanted to spell out what was worth giving our life to, what was worth giving our one shot at life to. You remember we talked about it last week? The teachers of the law came up to Jesus, and they said, out of all the commandments that are out there, what's the one, what's the essential ones that we need to obey? Remember, there was over 600 different commandments, and no one could live up to all of them. So they said, well, let's just have a conversation. What are the essential commandments? And they asked Jesus the question. He doesn't hesitate. He doesn't write something on the ground. He doesn't say, I'll get back to you tomorrow. He says, oh, that's really quite simple. And then he gives it to us, Mark chapter 12, verse 28. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. What's the greatest pursuit of life? How do you know that you've done life well? When you go to your, your bed tonight and you put your head on your pillow, if you love God a little bit more in that moment than you did this morning, you had a good day. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's your emotions. That's how you feel. You love him with all your mind. That's your intellect. That's your thoughts. You take captive every thought and make it obedient to Jesus. 
You love him with all of your soul. That's your passion. That's your will. That's your desires. That's your decision making. And you love him with all of your strength. You see a need. Oh, my goodness. You meet that need. You become the hands and the feet of Jesus. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And then he said this. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Doesn't sound too difficult, does it? Doesn't sound too hard at all. In the words of the Beatles, all you need is love. Wah, 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 wah. That's all you need, right? Shouldn't be too hard. Shouldn't be too difficult. I mean, how hard is it to love your neighbor? That is, if your neighbor is lovable, correct? Because some of us might be living next to some neighbors where it might be a little more difficult. I mean, it might be more difficult to love the neighbor, you know, next door. When they wake up and they're out the door at 7 a.m. And they always peel their tires as they go down the street. And they always have their window cranked down regardless of what the temperature is. And they're always playing ACDC Hell's Bells, you know. But that doesn't bother you so much because you're already up. Because they released their barking dog at 6 in the morning. It was their way of saying it's time to rise and shine and give God the glory of glory, right? That doesn't bug you either. You doesn't bug you that they pull their car in front of your driveway all the time. Doesn't bug you that they have more broken down cars in their front lot yard than they have at a used car dealership down the street. Doesn't bug you that they never pick up their trash or pick up their leaves. You'll gladly rake their leaves for them too. You love them in Jesus' name. Not so easy to love God and love others, is it? That's why it's supposed to be the greatest pursuit. I mean, let me ask you a question. How, how can you love the coworker who gossips about you? The coworker who lies behind your back, the coworker who's always a pot stirrer, always causing some kind of dissension, always causing some kind of problem, always bringing up some kind of drama. How do you love somebody like that? And how do you love your spouse? How, how, do, how do you love them? How do you love them when they nitpick you and, and they gripe and they moan and they groan and they complain and nothing you ever do is ever good enough for them? How do you love a spouse like that? How do you love your kids? They're teenagers and you say, all I want you to do is empty the dishwasher, put the dishes away. <gasps> and they roll their eyes at you. All you want them to do is go outside and pick up the dog poop. That was the deal, right? You get a dog, you pick up the poo. That's the way it works, right? So there's dog poo in the backyard. Hey, I need you to go out there and pick up the dog poo. <laughs> roll their eyes. You know what you want to do? You want to roll their head off their body. That's what you want to do. How, how do you love these kinds of people? Really, I want to know because I don't have a clue. Let's just stand for closing prayer. I don't know what to tell you. Someone stand up, sit down, I'm just goofing around. It's just a joke. How, how, do, how do we love people like this? Here was the epiphany that I got when I was working on this. Could it be that the reason we don't love others deeply is because we don't fully understand how much God has loved us? When Jesus said you're supposed to love God and then you're supposed to take that love and love your neighbor, if you don't understand how much God loves you, how can you let that unconditional, unrelenting love flow so through you that you would have unconditional, unrelenting love towards somebody else? See, I believe, I, I really do believe this in our sinful minds that we don't understand how high and wide and deep the love of God is and we put conditions on God's love and because we believe God's love is conditional, we pass on conditional love to other people. I was reading this book by Brendan Manning uh, called The Rabbi's Heartbeat and in the book he tells a story uh, about a guy named Edward who was going to visit his uncle, Uncle Seamus. And Uncle Seamus was 80 years old, lived in California, coast of California. And so they got up really early one day, and they wanted to see the sun come out over the horizon of the ocean. Now, you folks who live in Belize, you know how good you've got it. You get the chance to see that. It's just absolutely gorgeous. It's breathtaking. It reminds you of the goodness of God. So they're out there, they're walking along the shores of California, the sun is coming up, it's glistening, the sunlight's glistening off of the ocean, and it's just majestic, it's just absolutely beautiful. And they're just walking along the shoreline, their toes are getting wet, you know, their open-toed sandals enjoying the ocean breeze and the water, 
They don't even say a word. They're just taken in the moment. Then all of a sudden, Uncle Seamus just takes off. I mean, just takes off, just starts running. 80-year-old man just starts running up and down the beach. And he's smiling and he's laughing. And Edward said, Uncle, what's going on? You're awful happy today. And Uncle Seamus said, I, I am, son, I am. He said, what's made you so happy today? And this was his response. He said, the Lord is awfully fond of me. Now, I remember reading that. I was sitting in my bed, and I remember putting that book down and thinking to myself, I have never had that thought that the Lord is fond of me, not one moment of my life. The thoughts I have is, he's disappointed with me. He's shaking his head at me. He's ready to throw in the towel with me. You see, I I think there's a lot of people that are sinful minds. We don't grasp how high and wide and deep the love of God is. And we think that God loves us with conditions. And so this is how it goes. We say, well, if I'm doing the right thing. And I'm saying the right thing, and I'm going to the right places, and I'm, I'm seeing the needs, and I'm meeting the needs, and I'm being the hands and feet of Jesus. And if I'm doing all the right stuff, maybe, just maybe, he's pleased with me. But if I, if I, if I Chris, when I should have crossed, if, if I say something I shouldn't have said, if I do something I shouldn't have done, if I go someplace I shouldn't have gone, if I, if I mess up, if I'm inconsistent, then his love for me is going to be limited. He's just going to shake his hands, head at me. He's just not going to love me the way that I need to be loved. And I, and I know that every one of us knows because you've heard me speak, right? You've heard me speak. And I say, oh, no, the love of God, unconditional, unrelenting. Nothing you can do to change the, how much God loves you. Nothing you can do today to cause him to love you more. Nothing you can do today to cause him to love you. And you're like, I know that. I know that to be true. But you don't live it out. At least I don't. I have a very, very difficult time. So think about how this re- equates to the relationships that you've got. If you think God's going to treat you with judgment, that you can never do enough to please him, guess what? You're going to treat other people with judgment. You ever notice how churches just kind of make these judgmental people all the time? I think because they think about the wrath of God, the judgment of God. They don't think about the grace of God, the love of God, the forgiveness of God. They think God's going to judge them, and so they're going to judge others as well. Think about it. If you think you've got to be perfect to earn the love of God, then you're going to expect perfection from those in your life. When they don't do what you think they should do, when they don't say what you think they should say, when they don't think the thoughts that you think they should think, well, they didn't perform. And so you're going to have love that's conditional because that's the way that God loves you. Do you see how important it is that we understand how great and how high and how wide the love of God is and that we would so let that flow in us and through us that we could then extend that on to other people as well? The greatest aim of our life should be to fall deeply in love with God and let God love us the way that he wants to love us without conditions and then take that love and pass that on to every person that God has placed in your life. So how do we do this? Well, you've got to understand how God loves you. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at how God loves us and then we're going to see are we extending that same love on to others. And we're going to pick four things. We're going to look at the love chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to look at these four things, and you're going to test yourself, and you're going to just kind of judge for yourself how loving you are, and we'll see if you pass the test on being loving. So we'll look at God's love, and then we'll ask ourselves, are we extending that on to other people? Let's look at the passage of Scripture. 1 Corinthians 13 says, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, love is not rude, it's not self-seeking, love is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love rejoices in the truth, love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, love never fails. So how does God love us? Okay, first off, God's love is patient. Write that down. God's love is patient. Aren't you blown away at the patience of God? Let me ask you a question. How patient has God been with you? Then let me speak for myself. He's been extremely patient with me. 
He loves me, and I've said this before, he loves me with an in spite of kind of love. He loves you the same way. In spite of your inconsistencies, in spite of your hypocrisy, in spite of all the times that you told God things were going to be different from this point forward, and they weren't, in spite of all the times that you broke the heart of God, wounded yourself, and wounded somebody else, God was patient with you. I like this little phrase that says, God takes you where you are, and he gently leads you where he wants you to be. Every one of us is just in process, aren't we? And so every day we're just trying to fall more in love with God and be more loving to other people. Every day he's working on that, working on that, working on that. He's been so very patient with us. You know, there, there have been times when we've rolled our eyes at God, right? But I ain't doing that. I don't care what you are. But God never wanted to roll your head off your body, did he? No, he has constantly been patient with you, leading you, guiding you, believing the best in you. Now, what if, what if somehow, some way, we could live 24 hours a day, seven days a week, understanding how patient God has been with us? And if we really let that truth soak into us, maybe, just maybe, we could become more patient with other people. I mean, in light of what we've done to God and how we've wounded his heart and yet he's been patient to us, what if we took that same patience to that checkout clerk who can't make change? Or to that waiter who continues to forget our table exists even though they're only at 25% occupancy? I mean, come on, man, give me a drink of water, would you? But when I think about how patient God's been with me, can't I be patient with someone? Imagine how this would revolutionize your life if you just lived under the understanding of how patient God's been with you. Then you wouldn't snap at your wife or your husband anymore, would you? Because you'd say, well, my God's been patient with me about this, that, and the other, and that's, that's much larger than what he's asking me to be patient with my spouse with. And yet we get angry and and we get frustrated. Have you you noticed how angry people are nowadays? And how frustrated people are nowadays? And how no one seems to be able to respond anymore with love? But God's love is patient. He's been patient with you, hasn't he? What if we extend that to other people? How How you doing on the test so far? Let me give you the next one. God's love is kind. Hasn't God been kind to you? He's been so kind to me. He's never, never treated me the way that I deserve to be treated. He just keeps on loving me and keeps on being kind to me and keeps on believing the best in me, even when I can't even see the best in me. He's been so very, very kind. And then he says, I want you to take the kindness And I want you to pass this on to other people. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32 says, Be kind to each other, tender-hearted. Circle that word, tender-hearted, forgiving. Circle that word, forgiving one another, just as God has forgiven you. So how am I I supposed to treat other people? I'm supposed to be tender-hearted, because that's how God is towards me. I'm supposed to be kind, because that's how... God has been towards me. I'm not supposed to be the cynic. I'm not supposed to be the skeptic. I'm not supposed to be the one who one-ups everybody or puts everybody else down because God's never treated me that way. He's always treated me with kindness. Now, let me let you in a little secret. The people that you live with, the people that you work with, the people that one day you might go back to school and see again, remember those people? They're all sinners. They're all going to let you down. They're all going to be imperfect. There's going to be times when they do things that aren't kind. I'm married to a big sinner. Christy is a huge sinner. I'm just going to tell you that right now. She's big, big. I mean, it's way up there on the charts. That's Christy. Boom, right there. The biggest problem that Christy has is that she's married to an even bigger sinner. That's the problem that Christy has. Because I'm more jacked up than she is. You know what the kindest thing you can do for somebody else when they let you down? When they disappoint you? like we've let God down and disappointed him, is to treat them with kindness and to treat them with forgiveness. In fact, I believe the kindest thing a person can do for somebody else is to be forgiving of them. Every day it it seems like I'm asking my wife to forgive me for something that I said or something that I did. And I'm very fortunate because my wife is someone who forgives quickly. We, We don't play the blame game. We don't 
We don't raise our voices. We don't curse at each other. We don't throw things around. We don't play the silent treatment. When I ask for forgiveness, she's quick to forgive. And she's teaching me how to be quick to forgive as well when she lets me down from time to time. But isn't that the kindest thing you can do for somebody else is to forgive them? And, and yet we hold grudges. We, we hurt the people that we say that we love. And, and I think that sometimes we, th- we do that because we think God's trying to hold a grudge on us. But what if we were better at forgiving and releasing the hurt and the pain at the foot of the cross? There was this girl, her her name was Sally, and she went to this uh, seminary, and she was having this class, and her her professor was known for doing these object lessons from time to time. And she didn't like the object lessons that he did. She just wanted him to just kind of read from the textbook or just do his lecture. She was sick of the stupid object lessons. Well, they come out on this particular day, and they see a dartboard over on the wall, and they see a picture that he's put up there. He said, I've drawn this picture of somebody that I can't stand, somebody that I absolutely hate. He said, students, this is what I want you to do. I want you to sit down. I want you to draw a picture of someone you can't stand, someone you hate. Oh, Sally liked that one a lot. She thought, that's great. I will draw a picture of my professor because I am so sick of these stupid object lessons. I tell you that right now. So she's working away at her picture, turns to her friend, who are you drawing a picture of? She says, I'm drawing a picture of that girl who stole my boyfriend. She said, that's a good picture. You draw that picture. She turned to another friend and said, who are you drawing a picture of? She said, I'm drawing a picture of my little brother. Can't stand him. So they're drawing their pictures, having a good time. So one by one, they put their picture over the picture of the professor, and he hands them darts. And they start to take the darts, and they start to hit the picture with the darts. And some of the kids are super into it. I mean, they're rearing back and just hammering. Whoops. They're hammering the picture. In fact, it starts to tear. They hit it so hard. One by one, they go. Picture after picture after picture. Every one of them putting their darts into it. Sally's turn's almost coming up. And the professor says, well, that's all the time we've got. (laughs) Sally's like, you've got to be kidding me right now. I wanted to put my darts in my professor's face. She's mad. She's fuming. She sits back down. She's upset. She didn't get her turn throwing the darts. Professor walked over, began to take the darts out of the picture. He set the darts down. He put away his first picture and revealed the picture underneath. And it was the picture of Jesus. Eyes gouged out. The professor said one thing to the class that day. He said, whatever you did for the least of these, you did it to him. I don't deserve the forgiveness of God. And yet he forgives me. In fact, the only reason I'm able to have a relationship with him is because he was willing to forgive me. It's the same way with the people that you have in your life. The only way you're going to have great relationships with your family members, with your coworkers, your classmates, is you have to become a great forgiver. You've got to remember everything that God has forgiven you for. And then you pass that forgiveness on. A forgiveness that throws your sins as far as the east is from the west. A forgiveness that takes your sin and puts it behind the back of the Lord. And he remembers our sin no more. Not because he has to, but because he wants to. So how are you doing so far on this test? I mean, is your love patient? Are you an angry, frustrated person? Are you kind Are you forgiving? Do you extend the same kindness that God has extended to you? Let me give you the next one. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. Love is not self-seeking. One of the biggest reasons we have problems with other people is because we're selfish people. I mean, think about it. I mean, this might just be me. Maybe it's not you, but I want people to do what I want them to do when I want them to do it. I want them to think the way I think and and believe what I believe, and I I want them to do what I want them to do, and I I just want all that because it's all about me. (laughs) And when people don't understand that it's all about me, I get mad. I get upset. That's not very loving, is it? Because, Because Jesus, my goodness, Jesus was so selfless. 
and I'm so selfish. Look at what the Bible says. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Regard one another as more important than yourself. I hate that verse. Don't you ever read verses like, I hate that verse? Why do you hate that verse? Because it's, I hate that verse because it's the opposite of me. I don't like that verse. You know what I don't like? I don't like the phrase one another. If it said this, regard celebrities as more important than yourself, I'm okay with that. I mean, before the pandemic, we had all kinds of concerts. You know, people would come. I got to meet them backstage. I was always kind. That wasn't hard for me at all to be as kind to them. Hey, what do you need? Do you need anything? We take care of that for you. Hey, take care of that for them. We need to take care of that. I was always kind to those because they're celebrities. I don't have any problem with that. Regard VIPs as more important. I don't have a problem with that. What I have a problem with is regarding you as more important than myself. Regarding my spouse as more important than myself. Regarding my kids as more important than myself. We are so unlike God, aren't we? We think the world revolves around us. We're just take and take and take and take. We're takers, aren't we? We'll take whatever anybody gives us. God wants to give us blessings. We'll take those blessings. Take those blessings. Take those blessings. Take those blessings. And God's not a taker. God's a giver. For God so loved the world that he, he gave. He gave his only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You, you want to revolutionize your relationships? You want to love your neighbor as yourself? You want to love people in a way that you've never loved them before? It's really quite simple. Every day wake up and say to yourself, what's one thing I can do to show that person that I love them? What's one way I can meet their needs? What's one way that I can serve them? And make a list of all the people that you're going to come in contact with. Make a list of your spouse. Make a list of your kids. Make a list of your coworkers. Make a list of your friends, all the people you're going to interact with. And just say to yourself all day long, I'm, I'm going to try to find one thing I can do to make that person feel special. I'm going to try to find one thing I can do to give that person what they need. It will revolutionize everything. All of a sudden, you, you'll be the hands and feet of Jesus. All of a sudden, you'll walk into a room. You'll see a need. You'll meet the need. And all of a sudden, you'll feel gratitude and, 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 and the closeness of God because you're doing exactly what he would do. Because Jesus was selfless, we should be selfless as well. How are you doing on this test? I'm not doing good on this test. I'm flunking this test. Number four, love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Isn't that God? God always protects, God always trusts, God always hopes, God always perseveres. God's love never fails. God has never given up on me. And I don't understand it. And I was just thinking this week when I was working on this, I thought, what if, what if we refused to give up on others? What, what, if, what if we kept hope alive? What, what if we were the bearers of hope? What, what if our love would persevere no matter what might come our way in the relationships that God has entrusted to our care? What, what if we always protected and we always trusted and we always brought hope and we always persevered? What if we never failed? You know, you know what I find interesting is that we want people to love us like this. You ever notice that? Don't you want people to love you this way? I know I do. I want people to be patient with me. Because I'm going to blow it. I'm going to mess up. I, I need patience. And, and I really appreciate when people are kind. Boy, I love it when people come up to me and they say they're kind to me. Because I have enough unkind people in my life. You know, just Google my name. You'll know what I'm talking about. I love it when people forgive. When they forgive me. And I love it when people won't give up on me. That they hang in there with me. In spite of my inconsistencies, in spite of my failures, in spite of the times I've rolled my eyes and they wanted to roll my head, they stuck with me. I love that. I want that from other people. Don't you want that from other people? Why don't you give it away? There's going to be a day you're going to be on your deathbed, right? Because life is but a mist. What are people going to say about you? I flunked the test. So I know they're not going to say it about me, but I'm going to work really hard from this point forward to let, the love, to let God love me. <laughs> so I can extend that love onto others. Because when I'm on my deathbed and I'm surrounded by my family and my friends, I would like them to look at me and say, 
Todd, you're the most patient person I've ever met. Todd, you were so kind. You were so forgiving. You never gave up. You persevered. Isn't that what you want people to say? Friends, in the end, there's only two things that matter. Loving God and loving others. Let this be your wake-up call. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I didn't do good on this test. And the reason I didn't do good, Lord, is because I don't trust your love the way I should. I still, many days, think your love comes with conditions. And so I pass on conditional love. I let you love me for a little bit, and then I get scared. I pray for my friends who are listening to me right now that feel the same way. I pray, God, that they would just drop the guard and they would let you love them the way you've always wanted to love them, with an in-spite-of kind of love. And they'd stop beating themselves up because you've already been beaten for our sin. And that they would imagine in their minds that you've thrown it as far as the east is from the west and that you remember our sin no more. And they would embrace that love, that grace, and that forgiveness. And it would so transform us that we would pass it on to others. Give us love that is patient and that is kind. Give us love that is forgiving. Give us love that is selfless. Give us love that endures. Give us your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.